Welcome back to CRG and to this R46 DX266. Last time we had this machine apart installing real cache chips. I tried to put 1024k of cache in there but as you can see here I was only able to get 512k of that cache working. Every time we try to enable the full 1 megabyte, the system would just crash. At 512k though, as you can see, it works fine. So while it could be a bad cache chip, I think it's more likely to be the BIOS. You see, the board on here did ship with fake cache chips installed, and that BIOS had to be patched to show them up as real. I think something funny is going on there when we try to fit the full one megabyte of cache that this machine supports. So with thanks to Chrissy over on Discord, we have a new EPROM here to drop into the machine with the latest version of the BIOS for this PC chips motherboard. And fingers crossed, this will solve the problem. So the keen eye among you might notice that the cards here have been moved around slightly, but with very good reason and more on that in a minute. Since the last video, I have also doubled the memory in here to 32 meg from 16. That should hopefully go better with our cache that we have. Well, the amount of cache. And speaking of which, let's get this BIOS chip in. Let's get those jumpers reconfigured and uh, fingers crossed. This is going to solve the problem. BIOS chip installed. So we need to alter jumper five. Basically just moving all these over one. Need to close pins two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you'll not be able to see it because it's buried down in here below the hard drive. But I need to alter jumper 10 from pins two, three back to one, two. And then I need to also close jumper 11. Right, is this going to work? I honestly have not tested it. I do not know what's going to happen. Is it still going to crash? Is it going to magically see that one megabyte of cache? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Here we go. So system still posts, that's good. Our BIOS chip is obviously working. You can see there that the date is now 1995. Still the 12th of the second, oddly. There's our 32 meg of RAM counting up. And we have success. 1024K of cache memory. Now, to bring us back down to earth, it is worth pointing out that it's probably overkill in this system and is likely to have practically no impact on system performance considering we do only have 32 meg of ram even doubling it from 16 one megabyte of cache is uh, still probably too much what we can do is run some benchmarks DOS benchmark pack from Phil's computer lab. Highly recommend this for testing any of your DOS machines. And what we're going to do is run SysSpeed. So let's see what this shows us in terms of the memory. So if we start on the top left of the screen. First thing I thought interesting here. Processor, Sarex, CX46DX2. Yep, that's right. 22 megahertz? What's that all about? Memory size 32 megabytes and there's our memory bandwidth 112.91 megabytes per second. Pretty cool that it also tells us our Visa graphics card and even gives us a speed for the memory on it. It's getting what's about four and a half megabytes a second of throughput. But then the bit we are more interested in down in the bottom right you can see there that it reports our L1 cache of 8K, that's on the chip, 48.20 megabytes per second. 
and then our L2 cache, it sees the full 1024K with a speed of 32.33 megabytes per second. A memory throughput measures 25.04. So what I think would be pretty interesting to do is let's jump into the BIOS, see if we can't tweak some of the timings and then we'll run this test again and let's see if we can't get a little more speed out of it. You know, I just thought of something. I put that BIOS chip in and then I didn't have to configure the hard drive, it just booted. That's weird. Is that weird? Let's just see. Yep, auto detected is fine. It must just be set to auto detected as standard. Anyway, what we're interested in here is in chipset. And in particular, what we're gonna do is try and tighten these timings. So our three, two, 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 we're gonna change that. We'll just go all out, will we? We'll just go two, one, one, one. Let's see if it's gonna be stable. And then our wait state here for the cash right, let's reduce that to zero. Our DRAM, let's reduce that as well. Now, is there anything else in here we can tweak? I don't think so. And I'm sure if there is, someone will let me know in the comments, please. Right, let's get back into SysSpeed and let's see if that's gonna make any difference. Well, isn't that interesting? Because if we look at the top left, our memory bandwidth has jumped significantly to 177. 0.34 megabytes a second. I did expect it to go up, but I did not expect it to go up by what? 50% or thereabouts? It was 112.91 previously. And then if we look down at the bottom right again, our L1 cache performance is up marginally. You know, it's 48.54 now. It was 48.2 before. That might even be within the margin of error for something like this. Our L2 cache is a wee bit faster, 38.12 up from 32.33. And then our memory throughput is also up to 28.9 from 25.04. So it just shows that it's definitely worth tweaking the BIOS of your computer, trying to tighten those memory timings as far as you can to get every last bit of performance out of it. I think what I'll do here is load up the likes of Duke Nukem and just leave the demo looping for a while just to make sure that the system is stable at these faster speeds. So everything seemed to be going really well. I let the demo loop for a while and then had a game of Duke just about halfway through the second level and unfortunately the game has crashed you can see it's uh, listing memory addresses here. So, looks to me as if our timings are maybe just a bit too tight. And I'll probably have to pull them back a wee bit just to get this system 100% stable. So I'll have a bit of a play with that and see how we get on. So the game's been running here for about half an hour. Everything seems fine. Played through the first couple of levels, all grand, and it's just running the demo at the minute. So the only thing I tweaked in the BIOS was to set the weight state for the DRAM back up to 1. We had brought it down to 0 before. That's back to 1 now and everything seems fine. All the other settings are just as they were. So you know it is very possible that if we swapped out the memory sticks in here for maybe slightly better RAM, that might solve the issue. We could get that weight state back down to 0 and get the full performance possible out of this system. Just out of interest though, if we run sys speed again, let's just see what the performance is now with that weight state back to one. Well, there we are, the results are very similar. The memory bandwidth is still 177 megabytes a second. Data cache L1 has reduced marginally 
to 48.48 from 48.54. Data cache L2, again, very minimal reduction, 38.05 from 38.12. And the memory throughput, quite a difference there now. That is 26.14 from 28.90. But as I say, the only tweak I made was to the DRAM weight state. So very possible if we swapped out those memory modules with a better alternative chip, we may be able to pull that back down to zero again. For now though, I'm happy enough with it as it is. So now that we have the cache up and running, you're probably wondering why have I created space down in here? Plenty of room to put a nice long card in here. But what's that going to be? Well, the sound card on our system is probably one of the things in here that could be better. Yes, this crystal card is a fairly decent Sound Blaster clone. It has nice OPL emulation and whatnot. But I think we can do better. And with massive, massive thanks to Surge, who donated a couple of cards recently to the channel. Who knows what this is? A Gravis Ultrasound Max 2.1. That is one absolutely gorgeous sound card. And that will be going in here. But we are going to keep this Sound Blaster clone in here as well. Because despite how absolutely awesome the Gravis is, one thing it can't do is Sound Blaster emulation. Well, it can't do OPL3 Sound Blaster emulation. There's no FM synthesis. It can do Sound Blaster digital sounds, but that's what we're going to keep this card in here for. So to put these two in here side by side, first thing we need to do is modify some of these jumpers. So the Ultrasound Max has three sets of jumpers. These two down here are just for configuring the CD drive, but since our Sony CD drive is connected to the Crystal Sound Card, we can just disable it here. And that is the way these jumpers are currently set. The one thing we do need to change though is the base address. Our other Sound Blaster clone card is set to base address 220, IRQ7 and DMA1. The IRQs of this card we will set through software using the setup utility. But to alter that base address, we need to change these manually. So this is currently set to 220 as well. And I'm gonna change it to 240. And all we need to do for that is move jumper six across to jumper five. But just before we do rush ahead and stick this in the machine, you'll notice something missing. In here, there's space for more memory. The ultrasound has 512K of memory on board here, but there is space to add another 512K in here. And if you remember back to when we first built this machine, the S3 Visa Local Bus Card also had space for two such chips on it and we borrowed the two out of this old Cyrus Logic graphics card. And while it will put this card out of action, I'm fairly sure it won't mind laying down its life if we recover one of these two 512k memory chips so we can drop it into our Gravis to get the full one megabyte of memory on here. And the whole reason for doing that is to get full access to all the MIDI samples. So we're gonna go after this chip here, just because I think it will be easier to desolder. And while we could just go uh, full steam ahead with the hot air gun, I still want to put a wee bit of captain tape around this, just to protect these couple of wee SMD components here. Yes, removing this most likely will put this card out of action, but I don't see the point in just destroying the card. We may as well be careful and remove this properly. 
I'm also just going to apply a little bit of flux down either side of it just to help with the heat. So let's try and get it off. Have the hot air station set to 350 and our fan air speed at maximum. Give it a second to heat up and let's go to work. So the camera literally just died there as the chip came off, but that's it removed anyway. Only thing left to do is give it a wee bit of clean up with a wee bit of IPA. Just clean up around this board as well. Everything else survived okay because of our captain tape. Definitely worth using that stuff. It's cheap. May as well use it, you know. No point in wrecking the rest of this board in case we ever want to bring this card back into service. In fact, I can't help but wonder would this card work with just one of its memory chips in place? Probably not, but uh, curiosity might get the better of me on that and I might have to try it. Anyway, let's get this chip tidied up and into our Gravis. So just while cleaning this, I noticed a little sharp edge on just one pin here. There's still a wee bit of solder on it. So I'm just gonna take the braid on our iron and just take that wee bit off. Simple as that. Installing this chip is very simple. Pin one is marked up in the corner here. And if you can make out on the top left hand corner of that chip, a little dot, that denotes pin one as well. Just line those up. And push the chip into the socket. And then Gus is going in here. Doesn't it look amazing in the bottom of that case? Okay, everything is ready to go. I have copied the drivers that we need across to this folder here. So DOS 411 CD. And install. So, install ultrasound software. Install cannot determine the ultrasound card type. Ah, usually caused by a base port conflict. So I've been round and round in circles with this thing. The Gravis ultrasound does not want to work on any base address other than 220. So I've just removed our crystal sound card for now. Let's just get the Gravis set up. Then we can try and reintroduce that Sound Blaster clone later. Well, I have been at this for a long time and it's as good as I can get it for now. Both cards are set up in here together with no resource conflicts, but there is one massive problem. And that is if you use the ultrasound, it knocks this one out of action. And then if you use this, it knocks that out of action. And to be honest with you, I cannot figure out why. The ultrasound is set up on base address 220. Ultrasound itself is IRQ7, and then MIDI is IRQ11, DMA is one. The Sound Blaster clone is set on base address 240, IRQ5 and DMA3. Nothing else in here is using any of those resources. You'll notice that I've had to remove COM2 and the parallel port that were connected to this board here, our Super I.O. card, and they are disabled in the jumpers. Had to do that to free up a couple of those IRQs, but even at that, I cannot get the two cards working continuously side by side. The CD drive is also being disconnected, but to be honest with you anyway, that Sony CD drive is not that great. Yes, it is nice to have in here, just as it came with this machine, but um, it does not read CDRs, just doesn't read them. And the majority of CDs I would be using will be CDRs, so what I'm gonna do with this in the future is just swap it out for an IDE drive, 
and just connect that to our Super IO card. But that's enough negativity for now. Let's listen to some Gravis ultrasound awesomeness. And one game in particular that I really, really want to check out is Transport Tycoon Deluxe. I bet you expected me to say Duke 3D. Everybody does Duke Nukem 3D. Transport Tycoon Deluxe is one game that I played an awful lot of back in the day. So let's just listen to it here quickly, how it sounds under the sound blaster. And that just sounds perfect to me. That's exactly how this game has always sounded. But what's it going to sound like under the Gravis? What a difference. My goodness. It's so obviously the same tune, yet it sounds so different. What about in game? This Glasgow, does that look familiar to any of my Scottish viewers? Probably not. But isn't that music awesome? How about something else? What about Doom? So again, let's just take a quick listen to Doom, as we're all very familiar with it, under the Sound Blaster. And there's no sound because I forgot to reset the system in between. That's exactly what I was talking about. Using the Gravis, then going to the Crystal Sound Blaster clone. Silence. If you try to do it the other way around, the system generally crashes. Should work fine this time though, with the Sound Blaster. And there it is. So when this sounds like Doom to me, this is how I remember it anyway. Why is the sound effects not working? Maybe I picked something wrong on the IRQs. Anyway. Let's try and jump over to the Gravis. Reset. Oh yes. It sounds awesome. Thank you. 
Gotta get the shotgun. And then just to get 100% secrets. So how about another game, such as Monkey Island? This game just supports Candy Sounds, Game Blaster, Adlib, or Roland. And these are the Adlib sounds that most of us will be very, very familiar with, because this is how we played it back in the day. One pretty awesome feature of the ultrasound is that it can also emulate the Roland Sign Canvas or the MT32. And it does that by using this little program, Mega EM. But because we have the ultrasound in here alongside a Sign Blaster, well, Sign Blaster clone, we need to run Mega EM with this switch here to turn off Sign Blaster emulation. And now we have emulation available for the MT32 or Sign Canvas. It's the Sign Canvas that's the default. So if we go back to Monkey Island and run the game this time with the switch R, we get silence. Because of course we do. Maybe Monkey Island needs that MT32. And we get that with emu set. And we want to run emu set with this switch here, MT. Much better. Doesn't it sound so good? The Gravis Ultrasound really is a fantastic sound card. Even if here it is just emulating the Roland MT32. So the ultrasound is a really cool card, but um, it does require quite a bit of configuration to get it to do what you want it to do. But we can put up with having to run various commands, having to reset the system every now and then, and forget music. The sounds as cool as this. So that is pretty much everything I think we can do to this little 486 system. Our updated BIOS gave us that full one megabyte of cache. We have the system performance tweaked about as far as I can get it for now. And we have one very, very cool sound card in there. Now, I did have one other card to put in here, and it's this. A different Super I.O. card on the VLB bus with built-in cache. 
But unfortunately, this card doesn't work. Um, I can't figure out why. Which is a bit of a shame, because this supports raid and whatnot. And I think it would have been really nice to have a raid set up on our DOS machine. But that's for another day. Might be a faulty ROM. Um, I am intending getting myself an EEPROM reader, so you may be able to rewrite those and maybe bring this thing back to life. But that's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this wee video, and if you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up as it does help the channel, it helps with the YouTube algorithm. Why not subscribe if you haven't done so already? And I'll see you next time.